Hi everyone, welcome to the VC panel for opportunities in ASEAN. And uh, today we are very excited to have two very uh, distinguished uh, invest and experienced investors. Jennifer, Jennifer Hove, the principal at Integral Partners, as well as Vadim, from the managing part director at Vickers Ventures. And personally, I'm extremely excited about this panel and session today because me as a founder uh, from Funding Societies, we're always curious in terms of how do VCs think about investments, especially during this unprecedented time of COVID. And of course, what happens after this whole COVID period? So with that uh, with that in mind, I'll have uh, both panelists to, to make introductions about themselves. And we can jump on some discussions in terms of how they think about the space, how their portfolio has uh, pivoted or adjusted, and how, do you th how they think moving forward the scene for investments and opportunities in Southeast Asia. So we'll start starting off with Jennifer, ladies first. Um, why not make a, give a quick introduction about yourself um, before we move on to Vadim. Hey guys, um, my name is Jennifer. Um, I'm a partner in Tegra Partners, which is an early stage VC fund based in Singapore that focuses on um, investments in the uh, fintech and short tech and digital health space. Um, we launched Fund 1 in 2017. We made 18 investments in that fund um, and we're in the process of launching Fund 2. Um, so very excited to be here with you all today. I'm on mute. Hello. Really <laughs> Okay, I'm Vadim. Uh, I'm a managing director at Vickers Venture Partners. Uh, you probably know us uh, because we are the oldest and the largest uh, venture capital firm in Southeast Asia. Uh, established 16 years ago by a gentleman called uh, Dr. Finian Tan. Um, he's uh, like a basically celebrity in Singapore, so everyone knows him. Uh, I joined Vickers four years ago. Um, I used to work for family office, uh, was on the other side of the board, uh, but joined four years ago and uh, never regret a day uh, because I'm speaking to people smarter than me every day, which is like a huge benefit of uh, this job. So I'm learning every day about something new, about biodegradable plastic, about uh, new generation X-ray, about geothermal energy. So basically, uh, like being engineer by training, I uh, learn about uh, med tech, I learn about molecular biology, about vaccines. So like uh, every day I'm getting smarter. So we're right now raising our fund number six, uh, aiming at $500 million. Uh, like, um, I think it's, it's good for introduction. Okay, well, I will pass the button back to uh, our moderator. <laughs> sure, thanks a lot uh, for, for the introduction. So we have one uh, very experienced and long-time investors in, uh, in in Singapore. And of course, we have a newer fund, new age, newer new age fund uh, in Integral Partners. But both of them are no uh, no strangers to, to, to Singapore and Southeast Asia. And perhaps a quick introduction about myself. I'm Calvin. I'm the co-founder of Funding Societies. We are a Series C fintech company in Southeast Asia, backed by Sequoia and SoftBank. And to us, um, even though we have, we have raised a few rounds of fund, we always think we are always intrigued by how investors think and this is not a stagnant situation right the investors thinking it always evolves along the uh, along the way so i'm really excited to get this started so i think the top of mind for everyone during this period is really COVID, right even as we we reach perhaps halfway point in terms of the COVID situation um curious about both uh both both funds big for vadim as well as jennifer how have you or your fund invested differently this year um, be it at the start of the year or at a, at a, as we come to the end of the year, as compared to say same time last year. Um, perhaps this time around we have Vadim to, to kick off the, the conversation. Okay, uh, so we were lucky enough, uh, we started uh, fundraising and basically investing uh, pre-COVID. We started in October last year. Um, I think we closed like close about 200 million uh, by the COVID started and uh, our fund was almost fully allocated. So, uh, because uh, in a space that we're investing, we're typically tracking companies for a very long time before we pull the trigger. Because uh, deep tech is our focus and uh, technology is typically uh, takes a lot of time to develop. So sometimes we track a company for a year before we, we pull the trigger because uh, it could be too early for us, uh, but we like the space, we like the team, so we're happy to track them. Uh, so basically, when COVID started, we are in a process of uh, closing multiple deals. Uh, it didn't derail us, it just uh, slowed it down. Uh, but we are lucky enough, we are not affected at all 
probably COVID even benefited for us uh, because, you know, COVID uh, separated men from boys. So, and we are uh, shining in this new environment because uh, our strategy uh, was very safe, appeared to be very safe. So, since we were investing in tech and uh, biotech, and all these uh, industries, uh, they just propelled by COVID. You see what's happening. All these shared economies are out, uh, like gaming is out. Uh, but all companies that are performing right now, it's a technology company and life science. And the amount of money right now is like, available is unbelievable. Because all these government stimulus, uh, they basically were rich, uh, re reshuffled and come back to the economy. Look what happens on the stock market. And a uh, similar situation, uh, I feel it, uh, happens in our space. But right now it's just more concentrated. Because uh, right now it's like, you know, from investor's point of view, from LP's point of view, it's a flight to quality. So if you have a choice uh, whether to invest in you know, emerging manager uh, or established manager, uh, you don't take a chance. Uh, uh, to invest in emerging manager. Uh, so you just uh, pile up on the guys uh, with a very long track record and uh, uh, with a portfolio uh, which is resilient to COVID. Uh, look at our portfolio. We have like a COVID vaccine company. We have a COVID therapeutic company. They were not aiming at COVID, at pre-COVID. We invested at them at pre-COVID. But they just pivoted. Uh, for example, uh, our COVID vaccine company, uh, they were aiming at dengue and, uh, and yellow fever vaccine. Uh, yeah. But they just pivoted and right now they're developing a novel, completely different uh, COVID vaccine and already starting human clinical trial. So, so it sounds so, like you went more aggressive, given your investments were all mostly in tech, do you went more aggressive or do you actually and do you adjust the valuation? Nothing, nothing changed. Uh, we, we are not more aggressive because we are doing our job as we were doing it pre-COVID and we continue to do it. And from my point of view, uh, the situation just become uh, more crystal clear. So, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, like a severe situation, uh, weak uh, animals die and uh, strong animals just survive and become stronger. So from my point of view, it's just like a, a watershed. Uh, so strong, strong animal will become stronger, weak animal will die. Uh, similar for companies. Uh, to be honest, uh, like we see the similar situation for companies. Uh, strong companies, they don't have problem to raise money. They're raising money and they are still oversubscribed. For example, we closed the uh, round for our biodegradable plastic company. Uh, they were like three times oversubscribed uh, at the middle of the COVID situation, at the middle of lockdown. This actually happened to like in March, April. We were sitting in lockdown and these people like three times oversubscribed. Because uh, like investors are like uh, Koch Industries, IKEA. So uh, this, these guys are not affected at all. So COVID, no COVID, people still eating, people still drinking, people still go to IKEA. So uh, this is why like I don't see... There's so much negative impact from COVID. So, so not much change, but there's a lot more clarity. How about Absolutely. Jennifer? Do you all invest differently this year compared to last year? Uh, I think it's been very fortunate for us in the sense that the sectors that we have always been traditionally focused on were the ones that benefited immensely, as, as Vadim cor correctly pointed out, uh, from the effect of the pandemic. Um, and so, so the way I think that um, our approach has changed was that when we went into lockdown, we were very hyper-focused. Um, um, making sure that there was enough runway across the portfolio companies. Um, and, and, and the nice surprise for us is, you know, as, as, as Vadim pointed out, the ones, um, everybody kind of emerged from the lockdown with at least 18 months of runway, which is exactly what we wanted to see happen. Um, we had companies who were very well placed to kind of take advantage of this particular moment in time. Um, we also had companies that benefited immensely uh, from the long-term trends and the second order effects of COVID-19, but that needed a little bit more help to kind of get through the short term. Um, and those are the ones that we focused on. Um, and so our deployment has been, 
I would say a little bit more cautious than we um, historically would have liked for it to be because we wanted to make sure that we have sufficient reserves to support um, the existing portfolio. Um, but, you know, it's very clear that um, crisis years are the years in which uh, fund returns tend to actually go through the roof in the long run. So um, yep. very much looking for um, opportunities uh, in the space now. Um, and then as we launched Fund 2 in Q1, um, you know, adding health tech to our strategy wasn't the plan because of COVID. It's always kind of been on the horizon for us, but it's a, it's a very fortunate kind of uh, confluence of events. So how do you reconcile the two things that was said, right? One was that, hey, the, there's a lot more clarity because the strong gets stronger, the weak gets weaker, right? But at the same time, investments, investors are more cautious during this period of time because it becomes clearer. Technically, you don't have, it is, the, the, the level of caution is less, right? Because the, you can see the trend very clearly. How do you balance between uh, clarity of, of the, or, or rather the market uncertainty slash uncertainty for the stronger players versus um, the caution that you exercise during with this uh, macro context? I think I think the winners and the losers become a lot more clear in this environment. Um, and I think you want to be a lot more aggressive about backing the winners as opposed to take like so basically taking a little bit more of a concentrated approach actually um, than before where you might look at a company and say, hey, you know, I can see some really good stuff happening here. I can also see where the risks are. Um, I think the pandemic has very much clarified how we think about those risks and which risks we are willing and not willing to kind of take a flyer on um, basically. So given that, I think investors are taking more concentrated bets to 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 better companies. Do you all, how do you actually face more competition among yourself for for stronger companies, especially for funds that have just raised new new capital, right? We've seen even dry powder to deploy. So do you all actually face more competition in the better deals among yourself? Uh, and I guess that applies to both Vadim as well as Jennifer. Yeah. No, in our case, we are like uh, in the stratosphere where we play. Uh, there are very few uh, birds flying, so uh, this is they are not competitors. Uh, they are friends uh, because uh, like the space that we are investing, uh, we are global fund uh, first of all. So like despite the fact that I'm sitting in Singapore, uh, we have uh, invested more in US than in uh, in Asia, uh, in, from our latest fund. So we are playing a global game on a global scale. So this is why, like, uh, our deal flow is tremendous. Uh, we just uh, uh, filtering it. So we see maybe 5,000 deals a year investing in 10. But we have seven offices, 30 people to filter it. Uh, in our case, uh, competition is not the right word in the space that what we are doing. Uh, because, uh, for example, we invested in a, a vaccine company. Uh, the founder, he's like, 68 years old professor from Oxford. Uh, and uh, he was actually struggling uh, to raise money even before COVID because most of VCs are generalists. Uh, they invest in everything. Today they invest in game, tomorrow in a social network, next day is a shared economy. And when he is coming to meet them, nobody understands what he is talking about. They need to invite another professor. Uh, to translate to them what, what he is talking about. But in our case, we've got like Dr. Xin Hon Lim. He actually received a medal from president of Singapore as the brightest scientist below 35. He's like officially brightest below 35 in Advaitya. Uh, so uh, this professor from Oxford, Thomas kissed him uh, when, when he talking to him. So because uh, he was the first guy like in a half a year who understand what he is talking about on the same level. So this is why there is no competition, because there are so very few people who understand the stuff that they are doing. For example, the latest guy that were hired, uh, Dr. Farrier in London, he is PhD in photonic physics from uh, Cambridge, and he used to be head of AI for Deloitte. So and after we hired him, we invested into a uh, new X-ray, laser-based X-ray. It's basically like a rocket science. It's a, literally a rocket science. The founder, he used to be responsible for military lasers at Livermore National Laboratory in the US. So the stuff that they're doing is like uh, maybe 10 people in the world who actually understand what he's doing. So this is why like, it's not uh, difficult. Uh, the, the, the main thing that people like benefiting from our investments that after Vickers gave them a term sheet, they go around and say, okay, Vickers verified our technology, 
please give us money. So and, uh, other investors said, okay, if we cash already in, we are obviously in because it means that your technology works. Because uh, typical investors, uh, they're finance guys, uh, but they're not technology guys. It's very expensive to run a team with eight PhDs in different verticals, and mm -hmm. not many uh, uh, VCs can afford it. So, so it sounds like from a deep, deep tech perspective, there's less, less competition because not many uh, understand uh, understand. Not that. many players, not many players, and uh, uh, the discovery. Uh, you know, we invest in a kind of a Goldilocks zone mm -hmm. because, because if it's, it's too early, uh, it's, it's just in a lot. Uh, it's too, too early for us. There is nothing to protect. If everyone knows and everyone understands what is this technology, it's already in billions. It's too late for us. So we invest in what it's already proven. Uh, they've got already like a patent, trademarks, and state secrets, uh, but nobody believed to them yet. So, and this is our sweet spot. So nobody believes. Uh, they feel relatively cheap. And uh, we're investing. So, and uh, considering that this Goldilocks zone, you need to discover it, you need to uh, track these companies. So, we usually have more companies on our table than we have money because our investment rate is so so fast that uh, we usually uh, run out of money before investment period is end. I understand. Jennifer, do you agree? Given that, I think in Integra, or at least I look at look at background, you you graduated. So, uh, uh, Magnus come lot at uh, at uh, Amherst, right? At Liberas College. Uh, do you see? Do you observe the same thing, or do you agree with what uh, uh, Vadim has said about uh, competitions? If you take a niche approach, you'll be fine. And do you observe as much more competition in quality companies? Well, yeah, as a sector focused fund, um, that has always kind of been one of our strengths. And a lot of the founders that we invest in, as as Vadim correctly pointed out, are founders whom we've had long relationships with, right? Where, where we may have tracked, you know, for example, of a company that they founded before um, and chose not to invest. Um, and that's kind of through both the fund, but also like the relationships of the partners of the fund that and the ones that they've built over time, um, even pre-Integra. Um, but I think the other point about competition is that the pandemic has caused a lot of companies to be far more willing to raise larger rounds of capital to kind of tighten their belts and make sure that they have sufficient runway. And so to that extent, um, I think it's actually created a more collaborative atmosphere um, in the VC ecosystem here because we all want to make sure um, that there is a, a, a panel of investors supporting our company so it's not just us. Um, and they are all kind of willing to take the company forward to the next stage and the next stage and the next stage. Um, and so that's been great. So collaboration seems to have increased along the way. And but we, given that the pandemic does, uh, does, I think on a macro perspective, hurt uh, or slow down the economy, do you actually see more opportunities coming up along the way um, at a, from an overall broader perspective or fewer ones, especially in more niche areas? And if so, what do you all see are the key opportunities and in terms of investments? Maybe from Jennifer and then we can move on to Vati. Mm. Sure. So one of the companies that we invested in out of Fund One is a company called Flow, uh, which used to be known as Asia Collect, um, which is a tech enabled or tech forward um, debt collection company um, that only does digital collection in an ethical way. Um, and, you know, it's been a company that's been growing really nicely um, for the last couple of years, but this is really their time to shine, right? So this is, it's an example of a counter-cyclical investment that we made that is really starting to pay off. Um, first, there, there's this huge structural shift away from field collection um, to digital only collection. Um, and there aren't that many companies in Southeast Asia today that actually even have that capability. Um, and second, when you kind of do digital collection, um, you have a huge opportunity to really take control of the experience of the person you're collecting from, the ultimate borrower, because everything, every interaction with the borrower is tracked. And so then how do you create an experience that actually is ethical and empathetic. Um, and when you have those two things, um, I, I think, you know, going back to your original question as to what the opportunities are in this space, um, I think there have been a lot of um, areas within fintech even that have been kind of neglected um, because huge amounts of capital um, have gone into the into very specific sectors of the industry. And now with the cycle turning, you are starting to see interest kind of um, really pick up in counter-cyclical um, parts of fintech. 
So it sounds like they're they're pockets of fintech. I'm really glad that you said it because we're in a fintech space. <laughs> <laughs> From <laughs> perspective, do you see an overall decline in terms of opportunities um, because it's so concentrated in those few uh, uh, in a selected few areas? And if the, in if so, what are the selected few areas that you you see are the rising spots? Ah, uh, Fadim. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so basically, because we're investing in, in science, we're investing in scientific discoveries. Uh, and science, uh, you know, it's a very long process to discover something. So this, uh, okay, like six, eight months of COVID or one year of COVID, uh, it's basically nothing in terms of uh, discovery time. You know that average time uh, for drug development, normal drug, not vaccine, normal drug during the COVID. Average time of drug development is eight years. So like uh, whatever happens one year off does not affect us at all. Uh, for example, we invested into the geothermal energy company, uh, which is able uh, to deliver geothermal energy anywhere. You don't need to be at the ring of fire. You don't need to drill into New Zealand or whatever. Actually, they are doing study in Singapore to make Singapore energy independent. So, but to discover, to come to this uh, stage where they were ready to invest, it took them maybe five years uh, from lab to uh, like a pre-industrial pre, pre stage. So, like, we are not affected uh, because uh, this is just a blip uh, on a long-term uh, investment strategy. And since like these scientists, okay, they just keep working on their discoveries and the new companies uh, emerging, uh, it's obviously a little bit more difficult for them to raise money because seed stage is completely destroyed. Uh, early stage funds, uh, I don't see like maybe uh, we will see this effect uh, with some delay. So maybe like next year we will see effect that actually uh, this uh, early stage small funds who were investing on oh, 100K, they completely wiped out. So my, my expectation, like my, my feeling that these people who are suffering the most. Uh, but uh, for big guys, like, you know, uh, all these uh, top funds like Sequoia, like, uh, Partners Fund, uh, they are raising bigger and bigger rounds, but it's obviously coming to late stage companies. Mm -hmm. And in our case, we could invest a lot with strategics. So, for example, we've got a uh, FX trading platform in Singapore, Spark Systems, mm -hmm. uh, Wong Ju Siang. He's a serial entrepreneur, sold one, one company to uh, Unfinancial, received grant from MAS, uh, Singapore Central Bank, uh, to launch his next company. Uh, Co-investors with us, Goldman Sachs, Citibank, HSBC, Look, these guys not affected. COVID, no COVID, uh, their coffers are almost full. Uh, so, uh, like, uh, this is why it's so easy to raise money if, uh, if you're in the right place uh, and with the right co right co investors. No difficult at all. So, so we have been talking about a lot of opportunity, uh, a lot of uh, examples of companies that has meant to be in the right space and wrote on the wave, right? Uh, can you share perhaps, uh, and there's always a saying, never waste a crisis. Can you share perhaps one or two of your portfolio companies that happen to be in the wrong space in this period of time? Because the reality is that a lot of companies are probably more adversely impacted by COVID than it was positively support, right? How have they used this as an opportunity for growth, if, if at all, or at least mitigate the re the downside risk during this period of time? Oh, sure. oh Vadim, go, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. Ladies first. <laughs> uh, well, first I want to thank Vadim for calling out Spark Systems because that's been one of the shining stars in our portfolio this year. Um, and one that we are, you know, you know, it's, it's a pleasure to have Vickers on board as a co-investor with us. Um, but um, in, in terms of the companies that I think have um, chosen to use this time as a way to grow even kind of through difficulty, I would say um, we have probably two or three companies, and I won't call them out by name, that um, were kind of a digital interface, right, between banks and their customers uh, in some way, shape, or form. Um, some of those banks were able to kind of transition very smoothly to work from home. And some of those banks um, were not, right? They were ones who relied on having people pushing paper um, in the office at the back end of whatever kind of user experience you're delivering on the front end. Um, and in those instances, I think, you know, as I, as I pointed 
pointed out earlier in terms of companies that we think will ultimately do well in the future because um, they are the companies that have been actively pushing um, industry stakeholders to do better in terms of driving digital adoption um, and have been kind of banging their heads against the wall until this pandemic hit. Um, those are the ones that will survive um, and go on to do well, but in the short run have made some very difficult decisions when it comes to manpower and resource allocation. Um, the surprise has been the fact that they have also been able to deliver what has actually been ultimately like post lockdown, much better results, even on much leaner teams. Um, and, and so I think it's been not just a reversion to quality, I think as Vadim pointed out, but also um, the ability to kind of consolidate and then strengthen your strategy going forward. You're on mute. So it sounds like some companies, even though maybe against uh, the cycle, but uh, have been able to use this opportunity to consolidate. Um, how about Vadim? What are the comp any companies or examples we, that have that are in, in, in our case? Yeah. Because like we have uh, become a deep tech focused uh, investors uh, relatively recently. For example, Fund Six, uh, we are located to fourteen companies, all of them in deep, deep tech space none of them affected as i mentioned some of them even benefiting from COVID. Mm -hmm. from our earlier funds uh, when we were not so uh, precise in terms of deep tech when we were investing uh, a little bit around uh, we've got like our oh, shared economy company in thailand uh, from earlier funds. so okay it's a complete write-off but because it was not a, a core strategy and we invested very little you know, our, our, our strategy to pile up on winners. So if you are a winner, we are piling up and we are uh, disproportionately allocated to this particular company. And we've got a few like uh, fringes, uh, you know, uh, like uh, uh, take a trial, like research and development space. Uh, where we put like one million, two million. Uh, if this company fails, no, okay. Uh, uh, we we regret uh, because it's it's like your children. So and and they and they failed only because we pulled the plug. Uh, so and we, they probably blame us uh, that we uh, didn't help them uh, at the right at the tough moment. But this is like uh, you know uh, it's a counterintuitive um, uh, business. You are not helping your weakest child. You are helping your strongest child. So uh, this is like why we are piling on winners and why we are uh, letting our weakest child to die quickly with uh, less suffering as possible. So this is like, okay, good example uh, of uh, where not to invest because all this uh, shared economy business, it, it's fine when the uh, sun is shining, but when it's rain and storm, so these uh, guys are forced to suffer. So this is why, like, for example, biodegradable plastic company uh, will never die. And this shared economy company, okay, uh, they died, but quickly and uh, pain, painlessly, hopefully. So, so you have also liberated some of the weaker companies, portfolio companies to... Because they died because, they died because of us. Uh, so it's like, we should, we should accept that. Uh, uh, the company dies because you stop financing them. But uh, obviously, if you continue by giving them money, but it's again, it's a, uh, it's a giving good money after uh, bad money after good money after bad money. So uh, you don't you don't do it. This is a, like a tough tough life. I can I can imagine being a founder myself. Uh, I, we have been quite fortunate to have, <laughs> to, have uh, to to be at the right side. But at the same time, I think that there are I, I can we feel for the other companies. Just now, Jennifer mentioned that hey, there was a pleasant surprise that. Um, this time has really helped companies to crystallize their strategy or their portfolio companies to crystallize their strategy. Uh, would, what other pleasant surprise or root shocks do you experience for your fund or their portfolio companies during this period of time? Because many people make predictions, right? And as we all know, probably half of the predictions are not accurate. What are the pleasant, what are the pleasant surprises or root shocks that you have encountered for your company or your portfolio companies or your fund or portfolio companies along the way? Maybe with uh, with uh, Vadim first. I don't know. Oh, yeah, that is a very good saying. It's very difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, obviously, in our case, like uh, we know that, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, the strongest will survive, uh, the weakest will die. So uh, we don't see 
because uh, situation like I don't believe that uh, after COVID it will be the new world. Everyone works remotely, or we don't need offices anymore. It will be new economy. Uh, the, like people uh, forget bad things very quickly. This is like uh, uh, how our mind is uh, wired. So they forget bad things very quickly, and life will be back to more normal uh, in a couple of years times. And obviously, like uh, we will, will be shining again. So you think that the normal, it will be back to the normal as we have known. Yeah, I, I, I maybe slightly, uh, slight adjustments. Okay, it will be not a thousand people in the office at the same time. Maybe eight hundred people at the office at the same time. Some of them working from home. And like, uh, you know, I, I've got uh, a friend. She was like. Uh, a young mother and she was begging to her boss and she works in a bank and she was begging to her boss to let her uh, work from home one day a week and uh, no no it's impossible it's a bank secrecy you can't do it uh, but right now the whole bank uh, work for, from home like for two months and like uh, uh, nothing happened bank didn't go bankrupt so it's possible when you want to do it so i, I think people will be more flexible more accommodating uh for needs but like uh, you know from your own experience that like uh, interaction is the most important so and if you everyone locked down at home so uh, the interaction is suffering and the interaction is creating creativity and everything is linked together and uh, like uh, it's very difficult to invest in uh, uh, for example lifetime of the fund is a 10 years mm -hmm. and uh, you know that like average uh, marriage term in Singapore, seven something, so like 7.9 years. So basically, yeah, basically, we should be more careful before we invest in a company because it's a 10-year fund. We're supposed to stay with people like for 10 years. Uh, then we, you are looking for your spouse. So <laughs> how do you suppose to do it remotely without like... Uh, uh, I, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to choose like spouse for uh, over, over Zoom. So, so clearly Tinder is, is not like, meant for looking for spouse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is why I believe that like uh, human interaction will prevail and uh, we will be back to normal uh, talking to people live and uh, looking at the body language, how they answer <laughs> your questions before we uh, give money to them. I, I would really, I'm actually really interested in a new normal conversation or the not so new normal, but I'll come back to that. So, so Jennifer, pleasant surprises or root shocks uh, with all the predictions that have started, that, that, were, that were going in the first quarter this year? I, I think, I, I don't know if this is a pleasant surprise or a root shock, um, but it's kind of like when it rains, it pours. Um, and, and so, you know, I think we, as a kind of B2B fintech investor, we've had a lot of companies that were uh, up until COVID really the ones who were responsible for evangelizing, right, about digital adoption or kind of convincing banks that there is a different way, a more efficient way, a better way to do something. Um, and when then when the tide turns and you've got kind of customers calling you and being like, we need help now, then really the problem is how do you pick and choose your priorities? Um, because, you know, like delivering average results on 15 different initiatives can kill you just as easily as not having demand at all. Um, and, and watching our founders kind of transition from that and, and, and learning to kind of um, decide which priorities to go after um, has been a really interesting thing to see over this, this, this time. I, I like how some of the things that you have said is exactly what funny societies have done along the way. <laughs> Well, maybe Kelvin, it's your turn. Given we only have two panels, uh, two panelists uh, on this on this conversation, tell us a little bit about how you guys have adapted. So, frankly, when when quarter one came about, we were very we we were we were worried, um, especially when our share our shareholders acquire sent out the Black Swan event article. Oh, uh, so we, we, they, they 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 done it so wrong. <laughs> you, you see, right now they they should they should recall it right now. <laughs> actually, we, but thanks to that, we have actually made adjustments, perhaps ahead of many other players, um, and that, and very much focused on streamlining. Take, take, so we took the opportunity to streamline the business to stay a lot more focused, um, and that has also helped us ride out the, best, uh, the the COVID situation a lot earlier. 
So for, for example, we were fortunate to close our round in quarter one quickly because um, we, some of the investors were, were dragging their feet. We saw that what is happening in China, we quickly caught them up to wire the money, right? So that once the money is in our bank account, it's safe. <laughs> we don't have to sign a contract, but the money is in our account, that's fine. Um, but and, and the investor shareholders were predicting that, hey, don't expect to get more money during this year. But the fortunate thing is that we have been raising, uh, we have been getting more money along the way until today. And I think the trend that you have mentioned about collaborative investors, that investors are more willing to collaborate because they want their fund, their, their, their companies to raise more money. I think that's very, very true. We see that st more strategics piling in. I think that makes sense as well. That, that, that was very clear as well. So, so we do see that um, the strategy becoming more focused, more sharpened, business more streamlined along the way. Uh, but I think for, to us, the, the VC's approach, uh, view is always very interesting and important to us, right? Because at the end of the day, we are raising uh, raising money from your... To, in, in your view, if we all look look for... So we have talked about hey, how things have been in the last uh, six, nine months or so since COVID exploded in February, March, right? And we talk about opportunities in tech. Looking forward, what do you think are the key opportunities in Southeast Asia in the next six to 12 months, especially given that I wouldn't say tech is necessarily, like deep tech is necessarily the strength of Southeast Asia, frankly, um, or at least it's very limited to a few, right? Um, what do you think is the key investment or startup opportunities in Southeast Asia, especially in the next six to 12 months? Or if you think that tech it is a strength in Southeast Asia, if you correct me if I'm wrong, um, maybe start with Vadim first. Uh, look, um, obviously, Southeast Asia is not the hotbed for deep tech. You like will not find a new uh, drug discovery company in Vietnam. Uh, so, but like uh, you know, Singapore is a pretty good place for uh, deep tech, and uh, we invested in a few deep tech companies in Singapore. For example, uh, new kidney dialysis machine. Our company AWAC. Uh, it's a Singaporean company, first trial in Singapore, uh, phase two they are going to do in the US. Uh, they are like, uh, based in Singapore, licensed technology from uh, University uh, UCLA, so, and developed it here. So we believe that there are like, uh, some uh, pockets of expertise in Singapore exist, because you know Singaporean government uh, spent tremendous amount of money into blue sky research. So a uh, few of these... Uh, uh, results are coming into like uh, uh, industry, so commercializing and uh, entrepreneurs uh, emerging. So I believe it's uh, there is a possibility. Uh, obviously, again, in our case, we are looking the best solution globally. It it does not it, it shouldn't be a best in Singapore. It's like gravity, you know. If, if if gravity works in Singapore, it works everywhere. So if it's uh, you know pancreatic cancer drug. People don't care from what country it's coming uh, as soon as it works. So this is why our, our like a deal flow is global and we compete in them on the same table. So uh, opportunities are emerging and uh, like uh, again, there is uh, science have not stopped and scientists haven't stopped thinking because of COVID. So we believe that uh, like as I mentioned before, competition at early stage. Uh, completely gone, uh, so it will be very difficult to raise like uh, seed money. Uh, but for people who already survived this crisis, they will just emerge stronger. And as Jennifer said, uh, like uh, concentration, concentration, like uh, they're, they're going into spotlight. These good guys, they're going in spo into spotlight. It would be easier to spot them. Yeah, that, uh, if I just uh, prop further, right? So you mentioned about there was some pockets of opportunities in deep tech in Singapore. What are those pockets? Uh, life science. Life science is a good space, and we've got expertise in life science. We're tracking a few companies. We invested in a few companies. So life science is a uh, good space to be. So biotech is a strong, strong, strong in Singapore. Uh, the, like you see fintech. Uh, so uh, Jennifer and I were. Uh, invested in the same company, uh, so and uh, there could be more. So why not? And uh, you know, Singapore, we are part of fintech festival, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we must be bullish. Uh, otherwise, they will not call us to talk again. We must be bullish <laughs> on Singaporean fintech. Uh, so you know, this uh, digital banking license uh, yeah. was distributed, and we have a fantastic company, uh, Much Move, uh, that haven't received a license, but. Uh, it didn't make it uh, any worse because they will be getting license in you know Philippines, <laughs> Vietnam, Thailand, etc. Uh, but they're going strong, and uh, the market in Southeast Asia for this kind of business is very hot. 
So we believe that like uh, this space uh, very much in demand. So there are like a few few very very nice places to have a look at. I completely agree, uh, and uh, I, I will not I will not blow the trumpet on fintech, but I think there is a research that shows that fintech, at least in the credit space, is driven by three factors: uh, GDP per capita or GDP growth, which high in Singapore, fast growing other markets. Number two is learner index, basically le uh, level of competition from banking, so a bit bit weaker in a, in a emerging markets, which is conducive for fintech. And then finally, uh, suitability of regulations. I think that's something that's testament of what MES's work uh, is. So, so we do think that fintech is a great space. Um, but uh, Jennifer, opportunities in Southeast Asia. Mm. And I, I think, you know, unlike Vadim, who has the luxury of taking a global view, for us, a regional view is very important, right? Because, you know, we are a much smaller fund and, and the mandate is very much regional in nature. Um, and one of the things that we've really noticed over, um, like, this period in uh, during lockdown um, is we've been watching kind of adoption of digital payments, um, which, you know, is something that has been a, a conversation in fintech for a very, very, very long time. Um, but you have the countries in Southeast Asia who have invested in kind of a nationwide retail, uh, real-time payments infrastructure. So you've got Singapore, obviously, which, you know, has always been far more digitized than the rest of the region with Fast. Um, you have Thailand with Prompt Pay. You have the Philippines with InstaPay. Um, and then you have the countries that don't. Um, and the, even though everybody has seen a dramatic increase in adoption of digital payments, the ones who have invested in that nationwide infrastructure have seen a far more dramatic increase. Um, and so kind of like UPI in India, I think what is going to be very interesting over the next few years is to watch what kind of startups emerge to take advantage of that new kind of infrastructure to drive even more value for the ecosystem. So that's what I'm most excited about in the area of fintech today. So digital payments uh, between uh, which makes uh, more consumers going to going digital from a fintech perspective. Uh, ask one more, one last, uh, one more question, and then I'll open up for Q and A. Right, that what do you think would be the key trends that characterize fintech's uh, opportunity in, in Southeast Asia? Because some of the things that you have briefly alluded, for example, increasing digital payments prol prol proliferations um, could be one. Um, the potential flight to quality, as well as the the as well as um, early stage players being wiped up, does it mean that they will be potentially the last generation of fintech companies um, because there will be a breakage in terms of new companies starting up? Um, the FANGs and BATs coming into the space, so and so forth. Like, how do you think the fintech space will be characterized um, after COVID in, say, the next 24 months, or 18 to 24 months or so? No, so I think to clarify, it's not necessarily digital payments companies that are going to become uh, the winners in the space, right? But so, so much as, you know, the most game-changing innovations in the world have always been funded by a combination of public and private investment and support. And when you have governments kind of being pushed by the pandemic to um, drive investment in things like a national real-time payments infrastructure, um, then you have a whole he kind of heap of companies that we haven't even seen today um, and that have business models that we don't yet understand who will emerge to take advantage of the infrastructure the same way that apps kind of emerged, you know, when the iPhone emerged. And I think that's what's going to be really exciting. Um, but to go back to your original question, Kelvin, which was... <laughs> Longer term, longer term implicate the key trends that will characterize the region. Um, because to me, it's always implication, 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 right? So, like, uh, say if Vadim's view of hey, the early stage companies will be wiped out during this period of time, it also means that let's say two years down the road, there'll be less Series B companies because there's yeah. no stage that company become Series B company, right? So, um, how would your character or even the FANGs and BATs are coming in with N Financial getting the digital bank license in Singapore. How do you think the landscape or would be for fintech in the next two years or so, or key trends that will impact the landscape in the region? Yeah, so I guess let me let me finish the point about the real, about government financing, uh, government funding of infrastructure, right? And the, 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 the way it impacts startups going forward is that I think your unique selling proposition or your defense mode is going to change because these kinds of investments will level the playing field. And so for companies, for like for, for funding societies, right, which kind of started in 2017, 2016, you've had to solve so many problems for yourself because there wasn't a payments infrastructure that enabled you. There wasn't an e-invoice kind of infrastructure that enabled you. And now that you can, like, what are the new ways in which funding societies can evolve to deliver a, a better, more fascinating product um, to your existing customers? I think that would be super fascinating. So level playing field as a result of government interventions and stuff. Mm. Uh, but if uh, look, uh, I'm not so familiar with fintech universe of Southeast Asia because for us it's uh, just like a, 
a small part of, of in our investment strategy, basically uh, kind of inherited from our previous uh, funds. Uh, because right now it's more and more uh, on uh, by focusing on a very large global problems rather than uh, solving you know payment infrastructure in Thailand. So mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't call myself expert, uh, Jennifer. I think uh, uh, covered this uh, this space. Understand? No, no per perfectly understand on, the, on that front. But you're co-invested into a fintech company together, so <laughs> super excited about it. Um, let me just. Like, and since she's a, since she's a specialist, I believe we've done a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Collaborative investments. Uh, mm, indeed. Let me just open up for a floor to see if there's any other questions. Uh, any questions from the floor? Because I can keep going and going because there's so many things that I personally am interested and curious and uh, curious about. Um, let me just open up floor to see if there's any questions from the floor. As 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 we as we we wait for any questions coming in, um, I I will keep going and then until I see questions uh, questions ping over. Do you do you see the fangs and BATs expanding to into fintech or the Chinese players coming expanding into into sing, first in Singapore eventually Southeast Asia, be a major threat to local the local fintech scene or the local fintech players in your view, because I think some would characterize it as a competition, some would characterize it as a as a strong boost in co cooperation, um, and what how what is your take on on this uh, on this front with global players coming into a relatively nascent fintech industry scene in Southeast Asia. I mean, it's, I'm going to give you a cop-out answer because it's the answer I believe, uh, which is that it's both, right? It always will be. Um, there will always be niche areas where um, there is room for an early stage startup to um, make a name for itself. And, you know, I, I think that what is positive about the global players coming in is not just the influx of talent, but also um, exit opportunities, right? For kind of startups that may already have made a name for themselves um, and are kind of uh, a key foothold for what one of the BATs of the FANGs might want to do in the fintech area. Um, we chose Singapore as um, kind of like the, the headquarters of the fund um, and chose to base ourselves here because of the presence of global players like Facebook, like Netflix, like Google. Um, and not only because I think it kind of promotes a healthy ecosystem, um, but also because of kind of like the the talent merry-go-round. Um, I think it encourages entrepreneurship because people know that you know if your startup fails um, back in Singapore in the day, like you know if you're a startup founder and you failed, you had no other option. But now you can go work at Facebook, um, and you know you kind of take a couple years, learn some lessons, come back to something else, and the and the quality of founders has gotten a lot better um, with the presence of global players here. And and to to your to your point about hey, there's actually a backup plan. You can join a corporate. Do you see that uh, with this crisis, there's a tendency for flight to safety, not just for capital but also humans or talent, such that starting up companies or working at companies become less fashionable. <laughs> um, I think setting aside the question of founding a company but joining a company um, as you know an, an employee um, or start out as an employee I think it's 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 a cause and I, I don't know which one is the cause and which one is the effect um, it's very clear for example through our portfolio that we um, we did maybe not institute a moratorium on hiring but definitely hired a lot slower than we would have otherwise expected to this year right so from that perspective maybe the um, there were no other jobs um, in the startup landscape. Um, but no, I think that the pandemic has highlighted what has always been um, structural gaps in fintech and in health tech. And that will continue to be the case. Um, yesterday, I was a judge on the Slingshot um, MedTech, Health Tech, Biotech um, pitch competition and you know someone asked me like have you seen the the the, the nature of startups actually change um, that have made it to the finals and it's like no they're exactly um, they're tackling exactly the same kind of problems that they were last year and the year before that because those problems in healthcare have been long-standing um, and will continue to be there after the pandemic is over and we're all vaccinated um, so I, I don't think um, this this may be a blip um, from kind of like people joining the startup world but uh, I don't think it's permanent. So it's a blip, no long-term impact, uh, Padim? I, like, uh, I, I completely agree with Jennifer that uh, more players uh, create more, uh, more fruitful uh, environment. So there is, if, like, 
uh, if uh, like every every play, big player come to Singapore, for example, we've got like a very healthy financial industry uh, because there are so many big players. Uh, so basically, it's like a self-fulfilling pro- prophecy that uh, in, in like in attracting more talent, attracting more people, uh, getting bigger, getting better. Uh, my my little concern about uh, startups in this place when big guys are coming uh, is uh, like. Uh, is it going to be like Amazon, which basically destroyed all uh, small shops? So uh, there is a possibility. There is a possibility that it could be Amazon Amazonification. So uh, like, uh, that uh, these big guys will just destroy the small guys because uh, either buy them, for example, uh, Facebook. Uh, they are not destroying you. They just buying your startup and uh, it's becoming like a part of Facebook. So uh, there is a possibility that uh, this environment will be uh, like uh, divided between a uh, few very strong, very large players. That is possible because uh, eventually it's like a financial muscles against regulation. So uh, whether MIS will let them do it, perhaps, uh, because they also like to have like many strong players uh, in uh, and uh, the amount of capital available from their side is like unlimited technically so whatever they want to put in and play in singapore uh like does not bother a balance sheet in china it's uh i i think i agree on that front um, and it's partly why we have always tried to rush to become not just a market leader um but to us it's like how big a market leader like am i 3x the competitor 4x the competitor are we uh, what is our skill relative to to DBS rather than say relative to our, our fintech peers? Um, though though we do it opposite of uh, observe the opposite, which is like uh, I think what Vadim mentioned. Hey, the state early stage companies maybe wipe out. Um, I think in the last six months, we have three three FS staff has started their companies and have raised all raised good money. So 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 we, we saw a very interesting different observations. I, I have one last question. Uh, one uh, I would ask one last question. And I'll just wait for an, on the floor to see if there's any further questions. If, actually, I'm happy to just talk through because to me, I'm just learning things and I'm happy to just have fun myself. Yeah. Have fun with the panel and that's perfectly fine. Um, and 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 then I'll just summarize the conversations after, uh, after that. Right. So. Uh, I think a lot of, I think just now Vadi mentioned about, hey, there's no, there is, there's like unlikely will be a new normal because engagements remains important to folks, right? And uh, I think a lot of us have become fitter during COVID because there's nothing better to do by well an exercise. So what oh, are the consumer behaviors that you think will stick and what are the ones that will change uh, if at all? Um, let's, let's start off with Jennifer and then to, to, to Vadi. Yep. Well, I, I've definitely returned to the bars since they reopened, so there is that. <laughs> um, payments will shift online um, for sure. Um, e-commerce um, will also shift. Uh, it will also become a much bigger and bigger chunk of the retail pie. And I was just thinking yesterday about you know um, the impact that 2008 had on the retail industry, right? Which um, which was. You know, we saw some immediate bankruptcies um, right after um, the 2008 crisis hit. But then, you know, over time, that's really kind of highlighted the weaknesses in retail companies and how um, and, and how that kind of gave room for e-commerce to emerge. And I think in, in I, I think the pandemic may ultimately become um, the second kind of body blow to the retail industry here. Um, what other consumer benefit? Uh, I, I think this kind of new focus on health uh, will continue, but to a smaller extent. Um, humans will always be driven by our urge to eat junk food and uh, laze around on a couch. And so uh, we may all adopt digital therapeutics or like wearables and we may all walk 10,000 steps a day. But um, um, <laughs> I, I think we may not um, ever kind of transition to a, a super healthy society the way, uh, the way we, we would have hoped. So, so largely, some some changes, but likely, likely stay the same. Is a blip, uh, buddy. Uh, you know, uh, I'm 55. It, it's uh, this crisis is probably my crisis number six or seven, whatever. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, like uh, every crisis, people say, okay, uh, it will be new normal. Everything will be different. Uh, look, nothing changes so much. So, Jennifer, completely right. Like. Uh, uh, some like small changes coming. So uh, if retail was weak even before crisis, uh, the big shops were closing. Uh, okay, it's a 
complete death stroke for them. Uh, so like, like Robinson, after like hundreds of years, it disappeared. So, but it was on a way to disappear. And if it's not this crisis, they will be disappeared like in five years on, on the road. It just uh, speed up. Uh, but I don't see that it will be like a, a paradigm shift and we will uh, will be using flying, flying cars after COVID finished. So I, 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 I don't think all this like a uh, small, small like movement in the trends. Okay, we will uh, use a little bit more uh, digital instruments. We will use a little bit more uh, e-commerce. We will use a little bit more you know, uh, fitness trackers. So, but like it will not the paradigm shift will be changing our lives forever. I'll, I'll just do a quick summary and then I'll, I'll leave. Je I have Jennifer as well as Vadim share their last advice to, to startups. Um, so I think overall. We don't, say, we don't say, we don't say last. We say uh, uh, maybe a final for the moment. The last advice is like oh, okay. to go out of this panel and die. You know, I'm Russian, we are very superstitious. <laughs> uh, interim advice as, uh, as we come to the end. <laughs> Personally, I, I really enjoyed the conversation. And to me, I had a lot of fun uh, chatting with you, with, with you and I learned a ton, right? I think one, one observation about, hey, we everyone thinks about new normal and expect things to change significantly. I think both panelists reckon that actually things will not change as much as we have think. We actually think that's very interesting. It is consistent with what Ray Dalio's article recently talked about, right? That um, things will probably be a lot more opposite of what you would expect Um because because human behaviors don't change as much. I, I thought that's really interesting insight in my view. Um, I think another few insights is that there is there is a uh, there is opportunities available, especially with a leveling playing field, uh, uh, with uh, by virtue of uh, infrastructure that's being built up by the governments um, across different countries, um, and that there are pockets of opportunities, especially at the niche areas. Uh, but but startups will have to sharpen their strategy. Uh, and can take advantage of this this uh, COVID period to to sharpen that as the market becomes slower. Interesting to see that from an investment perspective, there is also more collaboration with, between investors um, compared to to competition comp like last time. And the strategists are still investing. In fact, um, we we personally experienced the same that quite a few of our investors are strategists. We will be announcing something like next week for from our for our funding societies. And previously, even in quarter one, Bank Rakyat Indonesia has invested into us, uh, and Bank Rakyat Indonesia is one of the in biggest bank in Indonesia. So, so we do see a lot more collaborative investors and strategics coming in. And finally, we see that there's uh, there's a flight to quality, uh, flight to safety that the investors are still investing, but you need to prove that you are the quality you want. And, and to the extent that you can't, the money will be piling into you, um, not just be it in tech, but also outside of tech as well. So really enjoy, enjoy the conversation. I've learned a ton, right? So with that, I'll leave, I'll have Jennifer and uh, uh, Jennifer first and then Vadim to share their interim advice as we come to the end of the, the panel. Uh, Jennifer. Oh dear, interim advice uh, to startups. Um, okay, so he here's one. Um, don't think of COVID-19 as this massive opportunity where, no, don't be trendy, I suppose, I think is, is maybe the better way to put it. Um, I've seen so many pitches, um, especially in health tech, but even in FinTech, right, that kind of talk about, um, oh, you know, here's the ways in which we're relevant for this COVID-19 world. And it's like, well, you know, um, there were lots of problems in Southeast Asia across the region when it came to access and affordability of financial services and healthcare. Like before COVID nineteen hit, they will be there after. Um, and so, um, think about um, where your market needs are. Think about what what you're actually what problems you're actually trying to address in the long term and not in the short term. Um, that's as much as I can come up with on short notice. I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I will, will finish with a joke. Um, you know, like uh, uh, rabbits uh, in a forest, um, uh, they they died from suffering. Everyone is hunting them. They are hiding all the time. Uh, and they come into a uh, wise owl asking for advice. Um, owl, what we need to do? How to stop our suffering? And owl t telling them, look, uh, you need to become hedgehogs. Like, uh, we are rabbits. How do we become a hedgehog? Uh, don't bother with me, me with the small stuff. Uh, I'm providing you with strategic advice. So this is what... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> got, got, got it. <laughs> we, we, with that, really appreciate uh, the, the time that Vadim and Jennifer uh, has spent with us and really, really learned a lot along the way. Um, and, we, and personally, I think that there is 
while while COVID is a big thing to us, uh, and we feel it now and uh, currently, I, I, it's, it seems like consensus is that it will be a bleep at the overall scheme of things, and that if we focus on the longer term uh, impact as well as customers, um, there will be a lot. There are a lot more opportunities in Southeast Asia. And with that, uh, I will conclude this session. Really, thank you, our panelists, Jennifer and Vadim. Thanks a lot, the audience. Thank for you, Kevin. Thanks, Thanks guys. Good one. Cheers. It's a pleasure.